You're listening to Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Can 3D printing be the solution to the nation's affordable housing crisis? That is the question that we're going to ask and we're going to talk about and we're going to answer today's podcast. Before we jump on in, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Sean Reynolds. I own a couple of real estate companies and I read the news from that perspective. Affordable housing, huge, huge issue when it comes to just in and of itself. People can't afford homes in a lot of big cities. One of the big things with the homelessness crisis or the unhoused crisis is that some folks are going to say, hey, they're on drugs. They're choosing this lifestyle. They've got mental problems. We need to figure out those solutions. And then the other kind of massive bookend to that uh, equation is we don't have enough affordable housing for folks. So are 3D printed houses, and you know what that looks like. It, it, it looks like a massive printer, and it's basically going to push out either concrete or plastic. You're going to make homes out of either concrete or plastic. Plastic. Yeah, you can see the environmentalist really getting a hold of that one. We make house out of plastic. They won't biodegrade for 10,000 years. Ah, oh, the planet. You know, that whole thing is, is, um, but they're, they're more efficient. So you're going to have less plastic, you know, 30% of the ways, you know, just a bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about all that because I don't really see this being a, a solution to the nation's affordable housing crisis. Let's just, let's just start with that up front. Okay. Um, so this is an article by NBC and, um, it, it brings up some really good points and, um, I think it's worth talking about, but let, let's first take a peek at some of the just broad strokes of pros and cons of building a house with a 3d printer. Mm. Now you've seen all kinds of stuff built with a 3d printer and damn, it's cool. I mean, that stuff is cool. It's like, wow, look at that go. That's just making some stuff. And we've got like real live stuff here out of plastic and concrete. Um, now you can't really put wood through the printer and you can't really put steel or metal or, you know, any of that good stuff, but you know, plastic and concrete, those are, those are pretty durable. Lot of, um, post-war housing was concrete block. We've got an entire community here in the Pacific Northwest uh, that had big tracks of homes built, concrete block, um, Mott Lake Terrace. And, you know, there was just a couple of models and they just banged those out. Used to have to appraise those. And one of the big things was, well, if you've got a concrete block house, you have to have concrete block uh, comparable sales. In that community, there was always lots of sales of concrete block homes, which is not always the case. Like if you have a log home or an octagonal home, you're not going to have comparable sales of those. Oftentimes, they're going to be really far out and not be relevant sales, but that's a whole nother story. So pros and cons. Here's a pro. All right. Lower construction costs. They have um, 3D printed buildings have much lower building costs than those built with traditional methods. You've got uh, projects. Labor costs can be reduced by up to 80%. Because you don't have a guy doing this stuff. You've got a printer head just you know, dropping the concrete, doing its thing. So you've got that. So lower construction costs. Okay. All right. How much lower and time efficiency in the whole bringing this aspect of construction into what you would consider the normal construction method there's just all kinds of things here that are going to take years to work out before you can actually, you know, have this be a regular part of construction. Um, reduced construction waste. Using 3D printed construction for architectural projects is more environmentally friendly. All right. I can see people getting on board with that, but the reality is, does it save any money? I don't know. While using very little energy to print construction will only generate about 30% of the waste the normal construction process project does. So that means that other 70% normal construction has that those components can be used on the next project or whatever, because it's, it's on demand. It's that stuff is coming out of the printer head making stuff. Um, so like here it says components are printed on demand and any material not used can easily be recycled for future use. Okay. All right. That makes, that makes sense. Increased design shapes. Now, now you're not limited to, you know, how you frame up a home and doing the angles. 
right? I mean, you can, oh, you can do an S-curved uh, wall now. Ah, that'll be great. Um, <laughs> in the appraisal world, we make fun of anything that's other than a box because it just so many issues there. You, know, you got to measure it. You got to figure it out. And it's like, why don't you just build rectangular housing? Um, 3D printing. So increased design shapes. That's a pro. All right. Maybe. Reduced construction time. Using a 3D printer to complete a building project can massively reduce the construction period. Yeah. Okay. Getting a house built with 3D technology can be completed in about a month and a half compared to the normal six month construction period. I do not believe that you can complete an entire house in a month and a half. If this were the case, we would be knocking these out willy nilly. This can be extremely beneficial during an emergency situation where structures need to be built in as little time as possible. Okay, those might that might be true for small structures, very basic structures, but anything resembling a normal home, I believe the construction period uh, time is going to take longer. And in the main story we're going to read, that looks like it's the case. All right, cons of 3D printed construction, building codes. There are no regulations or processes to get 3D printed buildings approved for residential or commercial use, period. This isn't a thing. This is So this is years off as far as being... Um, accepted as a, a standard of construction. The government will first need to come up with standards that must be followed as far as electrical, plumbing, structural integrity, and public safety codes. We're not there yet. Material types. The material that can be delivered from printer head is pretty much limited to just concrete and plastics. Buildings requiring wood or steel components would not be able to use the printer to complete those portions. Engineering compatibility. Very few architects and engineers have taken interest in 3D printed buildings. Hmm, interesting. There might be a reason for that. The additional comp compatibilities that come with the new technology are not being used during the design phase. Hmm. Traditional blueprints are not compatible for use with a 3D printer, so the entire design process needs to be handled differently. So you've got, so you can only do, you know, part of these homes with what we're talking about. Like, you're not going to really have a concrete roof, right? I mean, you could have concrete tile, but that's a wildly different installation. So there's, there's, you know, the foundation, the wall framing, certain structural elements can obviously be made out of concrete and or plastic. But um, so much of this, you're going to have to have a blend of the two. And, and that's what they're doing right now, right? Um, so 3D printed construction is gaining popularity each and every year. The benefits cannot be ignored by the small number of problems that currently exist with the technology. Okay, I'm just not seeing it as a viable alternative to stick built construction right now. We're just not there yet. Maybe down the road, we will be. But let's look at it as, is this a solution to the nation's affordability housing crisis? Um, and I think you're going to know what I'm going to say on that. No. April Stringfield has rented apartments since her early 20s and often worked two to three jobs to make ends meet. Fueled by the desire to own a home, she applied for affordable housing provided by Habitat for Humanity. That's a great organization. My mom used to volunteer for Habitat, so I was exposed to them at a young age. Um, and they require you to put in equity into a home if you get accepted to have a home built for you, or you got to work on somebody else's house. So it's not like you just get something for free. You got to put some sweat equity into it. And so I respect that. She and her teenage son just moved into their new 1200 square foot home in Williamsburg, Virginia, constructed with the help of a 3D printer. It's unbelievable, Stringfield 35 said. It's like a dream come true. Now, we're trying to say here that, okay, she got this house and it was built with a 3D printer. It's unbelievable. But she's just saying that about having a house in general, whether it's built with a 3D house, a 3D printer or not. So you got to keep all this stuff, you know, really kind of in line with, all right, what are we talking about here? Habitat for Humanity selected her home as its first 3D printed project. Initiated between a partnership with Alquist, a 3D printing construction company, it is the organization's effort to confront the nation's affordable housing crisis, which increased due to multiple factors, including the heightened costs of materials during the pandemic and a booming demand on the housing market. So 
We know all of those things. We've got low interest rates, massive demand. Housing kind of became the, well, if I'm going to have to hunker down with my wife, my kids, the dog, I'm going to work at home. The kids are going to school at home. I'm going to work out at home. We're going to do all these projects at home. I need a different home. That's literally what we came up with, right? So according to a March 2020 report by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, extremely low renters, households with incomes at or below the poverty level, or 30% of the area median income, they face a housing shortage of 7 million available and affordable rental homes. So we know that we've just got a shortage of housing in general. We've got a shortage of housing across basically all spectrums of housing. But specifically here, we're saying 7 million available affordable rental homes. The report also found that the lack of affordable housing is prevalent in communities of color, with 71% of black, extremely low-income renters spending more than half of their income on housing. Organizations like Habitat for Humanity are betting that 3D printing could help, could help alleviate the increased demand for low-cost housing. So could it help alleviate the increased demand for low-cost housing? Uh, Maybe down the road, but it's going to take a long time to get there. And I think that's kind of what we're saying here is, hey, you can do this in a, you know, there are little bits of application where this probably makes sense. But overall, does this make sense? And to me, I always come back to uh, no, but it's a novel approach and probably should be looked at to develop further down the road because we're we're so early in this process of building homes with the 3D printer um, that I think we don't know it. And we don't know the structural integrity of these homes, long lasting impact. The homes with concrete blocks that have been built, you know, that are 50, 60 years old. We know what those look like. We know what stick frame homes look like. We know what steel frame homes look like because we know what steel front, you know, uh, commercial buildings look like. We know what those look like over time. We don't know what 3D printer. And yeah, we can probably extrapolate because we've been building with concrete for many, many, many years. Plastic, not as much, not as much of a fan of plastic. I can see its application, but that whole, all right, yeah, stick that home in the landfill. That, that's that's not gonna that's not gonna biodegrade. But there's so many other issues out there beyond that, right? Uh, if you listen to some people, that's the major thing. Um, Takwaya Jordan, a senior director of housing and community strategy for Habitat for Humanity, said the organization adopted this method of building to meet the needs to innovate while also keeping high quality homes affordable. Are 3D printed homes high quality? I don't know. I have no idea. I haven't done much reading on whether they're good quality or medium quality, mainly because they're not permitted to be constructed. That's kind of the bottom line, right? It costs approximately 150000 to construct a typical wood home with wood. By using concrete to construct homes with a 3D printer, it saves Alquist up to... Up to 15% on building expenses. Okay, that is not enough of a margin to me to have this make sense. All right, new technology, that's cool. I am open to new, you know, shiny new play things and toys. But if it's only up to 15% on building expenses, all right, but we're going to keep going. What really drives us is that mission for everyone to have a safe, affordable place to live, she said. And we're all also interested in multi-generational wealth being developed through home ownership, which is one of the primary mechanisms for wealth generation in our country. 100% agreed with that statement. Wealth generation through real estate. It's a thing. I mean, it's just, you just know it, right? I mean, there are some families that you're like, okay, yeah, uh, okay, where'd they get their start? Real estate. It's, it's one of those things or they owned a big business or whatever, and they passed it down to generations and, you know, they did really well. Using 3D printing, to, but my point to that is, is 3D printers, we have no data saying that this is how we're going to get there. We've just got an idea of, well, a little bit of savings. Yeah, maybe we can make this go. I don't know. Using 3D printing to build homes provides numerous benefits, including a decrease in construction time due to the machine's efficiency. All right, but integrating it with the rest of the construction process, you know, what's that look like? 
I don't really know. During the process, concrete is extruded from a large machine into layers that form the walls, foundation, and footing of the home. While the machine is printing, it requires little supervision or staff on the site, which prevents injuries and saves costs on worker compensation, said Kirk Anderson, director of operations for the New York-based 3D printing company SQ4D Squared 4D. All right. Um, this is the only portion of this article where it makes sense to me, but it's such a, as far as real savings go, and, and, and so it requires little supervision because you got like one guy on site running the 3D printer head. Okay, so you don't have a bunch more, but it's not like every home that gets built, somebody gets substantially injured, right? And, and so, you know, you, you're going to have that cost, but with that cost, you've got, how about the construction company has to pay for the printer head, all the maintenance, all the, you know, all that good stuff. This is different technology. This is wildly different technology, right? We haven't focused on that at all because that might prove to be, you know, something not necessarily positive. And we just, we just really want to think about how a 3D printer can build more affordable homes and then get us out of this affordable housing crisis. But I think this is a major stretch at best. And that is just my opinion. And I haven't done a ton of research on it, but I am in real estate and I hear about these things and I'm like, all right, um, we're just going to have to see how that goes because there's just not a ton of data on you know, any of this really. He said that he's completed about 40% of a home in just under six months by using one 3D printing machine compared to completing a project, a total project within six to 12 months using the industry standard building practices. Okay, I got confused here because, all right, with the 3D printer head, six month time frame, we're building 40% of a house, not even half. But with stick built, we're building a whole project in six to 12 months. So is that really a time savings? I mean, I'm not, I'm not reading that here. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Maybe somebody else comes up with a different interpretation of that, but, um, Hmm. Yeah, that, that's kind of where I left that. Anderson said that he thinks 3D printing will eventually become the go-to method for building rather than with wood because it's a more efficient way to build. NBC News reported that lumber costs rose by about 154% in May 2021 due to shortages of materials and labor. That was brutal. Cement also provides, especially when you're doing a remodel and you got to buy stuff called wood. Brutal. Cement also provides better protection for homes against mold, termites, and moisture compared to wood, he said. Yeah, but it's not as aesthetically pleasing. You know what I mean? I mean, Mm, yeah, I like my wood. I like my renewable wood source. While a 3D printer provides a fast and effective method of building, there are some challenges. Weather can be a big obstacle. Here in Seattle, uh, you don't typically do a pour in a uh, concrete pour in the middle of um, you know, rain. No. So weather can be a big obstacle, which can halt a project if conditions aren't suitable. He also said many builders lack education on the 3D printing process. I would say almost all builders lack, you know, education on the 3D printing process because it's so new, um, which prevents more sites from using it. Plus, it's not a legit way to build an entire home right now because we don't have the processes for permitting in place. Stringfield, as a future homeowner, said she was in doubt at first when she was informed that her house would be built with a 3D printer. She said she was nervous because the method was so rarely used. All right, so you're the guinea pig, but hey, you're getting a house out of it. So, I mean, that's kind of, that was was the way I saw it. It was like, all right, but if I'm getting a house out of it and if, you know, Habitat for Humanities, you know, they're a good organization and they're going to stand behind a house. So if something goes sideways, I'm going to say they're going to come back and fix it for her because that's kind of just how they are. She also had concerns about having a house made out of concrete. Well, that's legit. She remembers her great grandmother's concrete house was always cold, but she's decided to follow in her footsteps. 
Well, now they've got things like in-ground heating, and you've got all kinds of efficient heating systems and insulation. This isn't grandma's house, right? Okay. So I figured this was kind of like traditional. She had one, and now I live in a concrete home, she said. I'll be a homeowner of 3D printing. I, I don't know... I'm just not, I'm not on board. Yeah, that's the bottom line with 3D printing. And maybe I need to see this in person. Maybe I need to see the home in person. Maybe I need to see all the numbers. But from everything that I've seen so far, I'm kind of like, ah, we're going to need to give that some time. We're going to need to, we're going to need to figure that out. Her new home has three built bedrooms and two full bathrooms. It's also furnished with appliances and equipped with monitoring systems to control temperature, security, and more. Pretty standard features in today's housing, right? While all Habitat for Humanity applicants must demonstrate a need for affordable housing, they also must partner with the organization with it, uh, while their home or somebody else's home is being built. There's that sweat, sweat equity. This process called earning sweat equity also includes enrolling in homeownership classes or participating in Habitat Restore, a program that refurbishes donated household items and sells them to the public. We have a Habitat for Humanity. If I was better at throwing, I could literally throw a rock. No, I, I still couldn't. Uh, it's pretty far. It's across, a, it's across a major street. It's across Bell Red Road here. We have a Habitat for Humanity literally across the store from where I'm sitting. And it's pretty cool. People bring in stuff out of homes that's going to be demolished and you can reuse it, you know, all kinds of construction stuff, furniture, you know, stuff on the walls. And they use the proceeds from that to build affordable housing for people in need. I'm, I'm all for that. I'm, I'm down with that whole part. The 3D part. All right. I'm, I'm going to need to work my way into that. You know what I mean? In addition to working consistently at her current job as a laundry supervisor at a Great Wolf uh, Lodge Resort, she said she had to pay her bills on time and maintain her credit score. Holding people accountable. All right, here's what it's going to take for you to get a house. You got to do all this stuff. And they do have to take classes because these are typically folks that probably aren't in an environment where owning a home has been a thing. They don't have family members. They can say, all right, what do we do here? They're getting like how to own a house 101. And I think that's great. A lot of the stuff where I see the government just handing people money or handing people real estate or handing people business, um, whatever it is to, for business development, that is great and all, but you need the 101 learning of, okay, I've got all this stuff now. You gave it to me. Now, what do I do? Because it's one thing to have the physical infrastructure. It's another thing to know how to run said physical infrastructure. And a lot of folks just don't know what to do. You know, you get that first house and maybe your parents own a house. Well, they're going to be able to kind of tell you, all right, yeah, when the toilet plugs up, you, you either use a plunger as many times as it takes or you call a plumber. You know, basic things like that. Or, hey, I was using the microwave and the stove and not stove is not a good example. They're on their own dedicated power strip. But I was using the microwave. I had the house lit up like uh, Chevy Chase and, um, you know, a Christmas movie and, um, and it all turned off. What do I do? Uh, you go to the electrical panel and you look through and the ones that are flipped the wrong way, you flip those back on and then you don't use all the power all at once and you you figure it out. But those are some of the things that folks who've never really owned a home like this are going to struggle with because in an apartment, a lot of times you don't have the options for all that. And just, you know, you're not going to light up the exterior of your apartment with a bunch of Christmas lights. So like many low income black renters, Stringfield works a full-time job, yet her income is a fraction of Virginia's median family income, which is 93 grand. The gap had prevented her from being able to afford to buy a home. Through Habitat's home buyer program, her monthly housing payments, including taxes and insurance, will cost less than 30% of her income. And I think that's amazing. I do. I mean, this, this is a model that has consistently worked. It's just that it takes so much in the way of resources and people within the Habitat structure that we can't build them fast enough to really help out all the folks that are out there. Jeff Olivier, uh, Olivet, co-founder of Racial Equity Partners, a racial equity training company, said homelessness and the lack of affordable housing are inextricably linked. 
In a March 2018 report by the Supporting Partnerships for Anti-Racist Communities Initiative, he co-authored, The unavailability of safe and affordable housing is one of the key factors that influence homelessness and creates barriers in existing homelessness, um, in exiting, sorry, in exiting homelessness for people of color. Or for people of, not necessarily just people of color, people in general. White people included too. There's lots of poor white people out there that are on the streets of Seattle. It's not just people of color, right? But I think the point is, is that people of color have have had these barriers in the past and it's an ongoing thing because homeownership just hasn't been enough of a, they haven't had the ability to to have the American dream like so many other um, folks have. That's just kind of where we sit. According to him, homelessness increased during the past few years due to a number of factors, including the pandemic, which had an outsized economic impact on communities of color. Nonetheless, people of color have been disproportionately impacted by homelessness for decades due to structural racism, discriminatory housing policies, and job discrimination. Yeah, and I see, I see. Th- I see those things impacting things, but we've been trying to work our way away from a lot of those impacts. And now I think a lot of it is just up to the individual communities because you've got some communities that the, their biggest priority is getting a house. I see it. I I see it with Afghan refugees coming here from Afghanistan. One of their biggest priorities is they don't give a crap about the car. They don't give a crap about the clothes they're wearing. They get a job and they start saving, they'll live however many people in a house that they need to to make it go, multi-generation, they start saving for a house. It's a priority. So in some communities, that is a massive priority. In other communities, not so much. And it's really evident which ones make it a priority and which ones don't. That is where I think a lot of this stuff needs to head. Communities gotta, they gotta, they gotta figure it out. And that's a tough thing because if they haven't figured it out to this point, it's like, all right, there's a bunch of barriers up that they're having a tough time getting over. And a lot of this is just gonna take time. The reality is the opportunities that people have in this country for economic mobility and economic stability cut across racial lines. Um, and black and brown people have been excluded from opportunities for decades, for centuries. And what that results in is really precarious housing situations with very little economic flexibility to withstand any catastrophes that might arise, like a pandemic. So however you want to blame the fact that there that people of color have not been able to engage in the American dream of home ownership, statistically, it's a thing. It's there. What do we do to deal with that? I, I think it's a multi-pronged um you got to take a multi-pronged approach to it, but a lot of it has to do with the community and the community's values. And if they place home ownership high in the priority list, they tend to get it done. If they don't, then it's not there. And a lot of times it takes people showing them, here's what you got to do to get a house. Now you know what you got to do. Now you got to go out and do it. Two different things. It's hard buying a house. It is brutal buying a house here in Seattle. I mean, it's it's just mind blowing. What percentage of your income, and that's if you can buy one, what percentage of your income you're going to have to spend realistically to get a house? I mean, it's it's just like, what are we doing? What what happened? Where are we going with this? Because it's gotten so expensive. Um, uh, It is absolutely possible for everyone to have a home, he said, but we got to fix the housing affordability crisis. Uh, you're not going to fix that overnight. This didn't happen overnight. You're not going to fix it overnight. And we've got to close that gap in units and get us back to where we were before massive cuts in federal spending on housing uh, started getting enacted in the 70s and 80s. Um, I remember hearing, uh, you know, some of that being in the 80s. I certainly don't in the 70s because I was, you know, watching cartoons and stuff. Um, I was under 12 years old and uh, it wasn't really thinking about housing. But by the time I was 13, seventh grade, I was starting to pull some comps. I was starting to kind of take a look around and see what was going on because I was working part time for one of my dad's companies and, you know, going down that road, wasn't doing anything crazy, but um, I was pulling some data and I'm like, oh yeah, okay. 
but the whole housing, um, federal spending on housing, that's a thing. They started cutting funding. They started cutting funding for a lot of things, housing included. Living in an affordable home eliminates some of the financial worries Stringfield experiences as a renter and allows her to focus on her future goals. Well, it allows everybody to do that, right? And I think home ownership is one of those things that if people can't obtain, that's a pretty big deal. It's like graduating from college used to be. And I say used to be because I know so many people now that are just like, yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to forego that and I'm going to go into a trade because so many people did the college thing and there's so many overqualified college people out there and there's not enough people for these industries over here. That's what I'm going to do. So I, I kind of see things that, you know, the, the labor market is changing rapidly and the, the cost of college, crazy, crazy, just like the cost of housing. Now, as we wrap up here, 3D printers. 3D printers. They might si- they might save a little bit of money. They might have some more efficiencies. But until I can see large-scale application, they're not going to help out with affordable housing. Maybe they're going to help out with some small components or some small aspects. But you know, Habitat for Humanity did, does a great job of doing what they do. But for every home that they build, how many homes are they upside down on as far as the need for said housing. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, I don't know, you know, is, is it in the millions? Probably. So we've just got an affordability issue in general. I don't know. I don't have the solutions on what it's going to take to get more people into housing because we're going the wrong way right now. We're and, and some of that is here in Seattle and Portland and in LA and some of these environments you're creating situations where it is viable to be homeless more so than work an entry level job that you're getting paid minimum wage on and you can't really cover the bills. So I understand why people go sideways and say, screw it. Why would I work when I can get on, you know, what I call get on the dole and, um, you know, clean needles given out to me free, food, clothing. You know, living in a tent is kind of the price you pay, but we've made that a real, you know, optional lifestyle and having people in housing right now here in Seattle, our solution is to build these tiny homes and it's kind of like, okay, Um, you know, living in something that's marginally larger than a backyard shed, um, it gets a roof over their head, it gets their belongings secured and maybe it gets them on to getting that job, gives them that option. But it's certainly not a long-term solution to the housing problem, is it? I mean, you can't live long-term in a shed. That's not. But if you're living in a tent or you're just living on the street, I talk with my guy Ehud here. He's our uh, videographer. And he recently moved here from New York. Um, and he was born and raised there. And um, he talks about, you know, in, in the downtown course, you don't have the tent structure like you do here in Seattle and Portland and in LA. People don't, homeless people don't live in tents. They live on the sidewalks, you know, with newspapers over them, that kind of thing. Whereas here, we've made it acceptable to have entire communities living in tents. So you've got these different approaches and you've got these different thresholds for, you know, what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. I I don't see the 3D printer really having an impact on, you know, pumping up the number of homes that are being built. But maybe down the road, you know, they've got they, they'll figure out applications. All right, we can build this home. We can build this 900 square foot home. Cuz believe it or not, you can get three bedrooms in a 900 square foot home. They're not huge, but you can do it. They're small, but they're a bedroom. They're, you know, arguably bigger than the backyard the storage unit that we're building as housing here in Seattle and in other parts of the country as well. But is this a solution that we're going to look to for 3D printers as the be all and end all? No, it's not. It's one small portion of what could possibly be down the road, some savings that big picture is going to make construction of affordable housing viable but it's certainly not the be all and end all. But I, you know, you also um, 
you know, there's, there's just so many factors going into affordability and home ownership in general. And right now, it's a losing battle. I and mean, the appreciation we're seeing is just, oh. And, you know, I cringe and um, everybody else is, oh, this is the greatest thing. We're going to have the greatest market in 2022. Yeah, but we're pricing out that entry level buyer, you know, every month that we go by. Um, so what do we do about that? I don't know. But we're going to keep talking about it because that's what you do. And eventually you come up with solutions and you come up with angles and you're like, all right, this is a direction we could go in. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. Thanks so much for being here. I wish I had more answers. I just don't. I, you know, I, I tell you what I see and I tell you my experience and maybe it's not correct. Maybe I'm just completely backwards. But then again, you know, it's my opinion. I am not the housing authority on anything. I'm a real estate guy. Thanks again for being here. Thanks so much for being part of the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. I will catch up with you soon. Until then, stay safe. We'll talk again. Bye for now.